<laughs> and I'm going to try this. Hopefully you all hear it. <laughs> nice try. We did. <laughs> a little bit louder. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have a bell yet, so I'm just using a recording, but I'm going to get out and do some bell shopping here. Oh, we oh, have a uh, bell, don't we? Yeah, yeah we, we got the bell at, at um, coffee shop. Yeah. Well, let's get started and rotary motto. Service, service above service self. Above self. self. And why don't we all stand up and pledge allegiance to our flag? <laughs> pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, 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 United States, States of America, America. America. and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, one nation under God, 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 indivisible, indivisible liberty, 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 and justice for all. <laughs> And Bill, if you would, let's have a moment of silence. Okay, thank you, Bill. All right, I, I do have some announcements to make and we'll get a report from Randy on, uh, on the cart deal as well. So bear with me just a second. All right, well, of course we're into a new fiscal year with the Rotary Club and uh, we've got a few changes, not any major changes. Um, but I did just kind of want to reiterate who's in charge of what. Um, I am now the new president of the club. Bill Payne is the immediate past president, and he's going to be keeping me on the straight and narrow. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, Bill Murphy is still our, our um, governor, area governor. Paul Strong is still our secretary, recording secretary. And Randy Diamond is still our, um, I'm sorry, Randy, what exactly is the exact title? I'm the secretary. Paul is the treasurer. Paul's okay. I'm sorry. You're right. And we have Dave Cabler. I don't think he's with us yet today. Dave Cabler is a director at large. And Reggie is now our president elect, and he will take over office July 1st, a year from now. And uh, we still have the same chairmen of various um, efforts that we're going through. Bill Stram, Stan Plowden, John Burtis, and Regina are all still the chairs of their respective um, um, efforts that they're ahead of. And Mehdi Pelliser is now our newsletter editor. Um, Speaking about Reggie, he could really use all of our help, suggestions for speakers. Um, we'll, we'll continue using Zoom probably up until Labor Day. <laughs> so these can be people from anywhere in the country because we can bring them in on Zoom. After Labor Day, our hope is to be back meeting at the coffee house. And for right now, um, we're not necessarily looking at setting up Zoom at the coffee house. That, that we may change that. We'll, we'll talk about that behind the scenes. But anybody that we're looking to come in and speak with us after Labor Day, um, we would want them to come to the, cap, to the coffee house in person and talk with us okay. and visit with us. Um, Reggie's looking for a contact person, their phone number and an email address. For that person so please feel free to email that to reggie um or you could email it to me and i'll get it over to reggie um big thing happened on july 4th and that's what i want to get to first and the golf cart raffle we had um, great news on that 
Randy headed that up and nobody could have done a better job than Randy. It was, it, it was just a wonderful experience to go through that. And I know he worked hard on this and I know he's relieved to be over. Randy, I'll let you go ahead and speak about the details. Okay, just, just a few of the details. First of all, thanks to, uh, to everyone uh, who participated. It was, uh, it was a good team effort. And uh, it, as it turns out, uh, it, it worked out. I think I mentioned earlier uh, to Joan, we sold 1,629 tickets. Uh, we, unfortunately, we only have one winner and that was uh, Lee Walker. A uh, local lady lives here on the shore, uh, who happens to be in Georgia at the time. So we haven't delivered the uh, the golf cart yet. Our our total uh, proceeds, uh, unofficial count. It's not official till Paul counts it. Can't be unofficial until until he gets his final say. But it looks like thirteen thousand nine hundred and ninety two dollars plus the $8 that my wife is going to give us happy dollars to get it up to 14,000. So, uh, that, right. uh, wow. that was a pretty good return. Uh, I think far greater than, than we had, we had hoped. Uh, I, I would be remiss without uh, acknowledging a couple of people who did a really outstanding job. Uh, Bill Payne, uh, sold uh, the most tickets. I think it's 193 tickets, <laughs> which is considerable. And I won't, won't go through everyone, but there were three people that I've put in the uh, over 50 ticket club. And that's Paul Strong, uh, Joan Natale, and Nettie Palliser. And if I missed anybody in that count, please let me know. But uh, congratulations and thanks uh, to everyone for, uh, for doing a great job. We had a real good return uh, outside of the club members. Uh, the uh, four places where we set up a table and, and sold tickets uh, all produced uh, at or nearly $1,000 uh, an event. And then the merchants that uh, Bill Stram, thank you, set up uh, did their part as well. I think we sold almost 200 tickets uh, between Rayfields Boy 56 and uh, Cape Charles Main Street even came through with a few. So I would encourage everybody to do the best you can to patronize uh, those businesses <laughs> really, really chipped in uh, and did a fine job to help us out. So that's where we are, unless there are any questions. You have to come. You didn't finish working, or did you? Randy, I really appreciate your effort. I mean, I, I, I don't know if people understand how much work you put into this. Um, you looked a little wrung out on the 4th of July, but deservedly so, and I'm glad <laughs> you're, you're recovered. <laughs> we, were, we were all a little wrung out on the 4th of July. What I didn't get, and I, 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 think, uh, I think Jim Rich got the young lady's name that drew the ticket. Uh, her name was Annabelle. An Don't have any more. Annabelle, huh? Okay. I don't know what I'm going to do with that other than log it somewhere in, in the records. But a uh, little young lady came up. She picked the, uh, the winning ticket for us. And uh, everybody, everybody seemed happy. Yes. Jim Rich was there, and he actually uh, hung around for the, quite a bit around the uh, golf cart setup there. And he took some pictures, and it will end up in the post. So make sure you read the paper. There's going to be pictures in there and uh, some some words from our member Jim Rich on the whole on the whole deal. Okay, um, projects. Think about projects. I'm not going to go through the long list of them right now because the biggest project obviously was a golf cart. But uh, think about projects. We will bring in Mike Ash who's a guest with us today, and we're going to talk about one of them uh, at length. So the Caboose Project over at the Cape Charles Museum. So stand by for that. Um, one of the things that Rotary International is pushing, and deservedly so, is membership. Um, over the last year and through the pandemic, we've lost some members, and we've personally lost a few members in our club, but it's not just a Cape Charles thing. It's actually international. 
and it had a lot to do with the pandemic. So we're going to be pushing for uh, membership. We really like the idea of trying to invite in some younger members like Mary, her age. Um, so if we can come up with some ideas of how to do that, um, I'm really interested in hearing about it. And we're going to make every effort we can to solicit some uh, new members into our club. Anybody have any comments on that? I like that idea. It's something I'd been thinking about and I had mentioned to you, I had been looking back through some of the older issues of our magazine and there are several articles in there about attracting younger members. So I think we can, you know, glean some ideas from that. They're a little different. It's not your run of the mill, ordinary kinds of ideas. So you have to be open to that kind of thing, but I think there's some good possibilities. Well, definitely we're open to it, Diane, because uh, um, we're willing to try anything to bring new members in. Well, Unfortunately, good. in the last month, we've lost uh, two more members, actually three in total. Bruce Gittinger and Dennis Libby have resigned. Um, they're members in good standing, so if they change their mind later on, um, they are definitely, they are definitely going to be let back in unless they go out and do something when they're not members. Um, and also Tammy recently resigned as well. And we hope that all three of them will reconsider and join us again, but we're definitely looking for new members as well. Okay. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, being membership chair, I just want to throw my two cents in. Um, our affiliate is a, a, a really a small, a small affiliate. So a lot of the suggestions that you may find on the magazines and things of that nature, um, they really don't apply to us. Uh, we're going to have to be pretty creative. Um, uh, again, uh, like you said, Chuck, uh, Anybody who has any any kind of ideas, you know, let's let's put it through. Uh, let's put it to the test and see what happens. Uh, again, like I said, our 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 affiliate is pretty small, and we don't have. What that do many. you mean when you say affiliate? Our our club. Okay, we have a small club, as opposed to some of the other clubs uh, throughout the uh, state or world really, but uh, let's, let's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, we're all, like, again, like Chuck says, we're all open. Yeah, one of the things that I think is good news, if you look around the neighborhood where, where Bill Payne and I are, um, there's a sort of a mini housing boom going on. So people were thinking about moving here, hopefully full-time, but even if, if they're part-time or whatever, um, we might have some opportunity right here in our neighborhood to um, talk to our new neighbors and talk them into at least visiting our club at some point. If you're seeing the same thing in your neighborhoods, if you're seeing more people move in, you know, say hello to your new neighbor and tell them you're with the Rotary. And we invite them to, to join us even as a visitor and see what it's all about. Good chef. Okay. Um, go that? ahead. Yes, I, just a quick comment. As with anything, just like the, the golf course, the, dark, the golf course, uh, cart raffle, for example, uh, you know, whatever we decide to focus on is really what we're going to get the results on. Okay, so if we have a, a, a specific campaign to get young people, we'll get young people if that's what we focus on. And some of us could com consider being mentors to a young person that we know. Uh, to get them to the club as well to expose them so that there's certainly going to be lots of opportunities i believe to get younger people uh you know to join the, the organization or at least to experience it for a while and see if they like it yeah agree right uh reggie i i sort of have an evil ulterior motive too i like young people being part of the organization so i'm not the one climbing up the side of a caboose to paint a roof <laughs> <laughs> 
But um, one thing too that I've, I've been putting out on that account is uh, even when Mike or when Larry uh, Lamont and I went up to the lumber shop, I put the word out there um, to talk to some of the young, younger generation high school kids because they have to earn some community service points. And we'd love to have them uh, high schoolers help us out at the caboose this summer. And, um, you know, we, we can definitely find some, some things for them to do for us. Of course, safety is, is a big factor there. But just keep this all in mind. That's going to be a big push for this year to increase our membership. Um, one thing I want to talk about a little bit, and Paul, I'll, I'll ask you to comment on it. We are looking uh, right, right after the Labor Day weekend to start meeting again in person at the coffee shop. And Roberta seems uh, happy to, to have us back, but we'll start those talks with her sometime between now and August and start nailing it down. And I'm just putting it out there. I don't know if it's gonna be this way or not, but we are seeing a lot of increases in cost to businesses and to us personally, food is going up in price. Um, we have some taxes starting to go up, uh, sales taxes, um, gasoline is going up, taxes on gasoline. Um, and we're going to negotiate labor costs are going up at, at restaurants and so forth. We're going to negotiate with uh, Roberta on the per person charge for meals. Don't be surprised if it may tick up a little bit. And that'll be part of our dues, but we're going to try and give the best price. I can tell you, for example, I'm going over to Tangier Island uh, in about 10 days. And that increased that to get over there. September, it was $25 round trip. This time it's $30. So it's gone up 20%. So that kind of put me in mind, you know what, when we get meeting back at the coffee house, we may have to pay a little bit more for the for the luncheon. So more to come on that. Paul and I will work to try and uh, get the best price we can. Paul, I don't know if you want to comment on that. No, no further comment. Okay, okay. Um, Central Park, August 17th, 6 p.m. We're going to be meeting um, outside and we will have a catered. And again, it'll be the coffee house catering it for us. And I think Bill, you, Bill Payne, you've been kind of driving that, right? No. Okay. Who is it that's <laughs> driving that? Me? No. Well, of course you drive everything, Mr. President. Okay. But, but but we have a social chair. Um, will the social chair speak up? Yes, I'll speak up, Bill. I, I guess I'm still social chair was last year, but in any case, <laughs> I'll, I'll coordinate it as as uh, as with before. And I think last time, Regina actually helped me, uh, so if she would like to to you know, help support it, that would be great. But in any case, we'll get it done. I'll help. And 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 Reggie, I think uh, I'm on your team, uh, but you're the chair until you can talk somebody into being the chair, and. Uh, you know, one thing I think uh, going forward, we're going to have to look for a little more engagement. And there should be some excitement with us going live again. I think a lot of things will improve. And I believe, Bill Payne, you, you got the permit signed, right? Am I wrong on that? No, you're right on that. Okay. All right. So the permitting is all done. So we're approved to be there. So it's just a little bit of the organizing now. Um, district governor meeting and dinner will be one week later, August 24th at 5 p.m. at the Eastern Shore Yacht Club. So all are invited, that's a three club meeting. I hope you can make it. Cocktails start at five and then dinner will be at six. Um, it's always a nice event. De Debbie Wall will be there. She's our new district governor. Um, and how do you sign up for that event? I believe, yes, we do need people to uh, 
let us know they're coming. So an RSVP will be required so we can let them know up at the up at the club about how many people will be coming. So I'll I'll take that on. What we, we usually get a notice from the host club as to um, the cost and uh, what and they want people to sign up in, in advance and they will want payment in advance. Uh, I guess the, club, the, the board needs to, to discuss this, but I think in the past, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bill or somebody else, uh, the uh, club has paid for the member to go. And it's usually, uh, I forget, what, 30, 25 bucks a person or something like that. Um, the, uh, and, and, but we ask the, uh, if you're going to bring a guest, which we encourage you to do, we ask uh, the member to pay for the guest. Yeah, I think that was it. Paul, you would know better than anybody else, but, but that seems be, because, you know, we're paying dues anyway. It's just a few more bucks. And I know you have rat holed the ways a little reserve. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll work with you, Paul, on that, getting what I need to do to, to get you a count and so forth. And so you can figure out um, what we're going to be sending up there ahead of time. And, and when we, we're probably going to need to get it up there within the next two to three weeks, I would assume. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I don't think we're going to have a real problem. We're the lead club, of course, right. and, and Monica... I think uh, is is I don't think Monica is concerned, but it might be a good idea if you, Monica, and I had kind of a turnover uh, conference call. So okay. Monica, I know you're the uh, interface. Are we the lead club for this meeting? Yeah, we're lead. Yeah, we're the lead. Oh, oh we're the ones home. that need to establish the cost and let the other clubs know. Okay. Okay. Right, we have to give the other clubs the instructions. Yes. And your deadlines. Exactly. Yeah, I will. I will. I will work on that. And and you, you put it on the uh, next week's board meeting. Agenda. Okay. All right. Um, we're still looking for an awards committee chairperson, and basically all that is is things that we do like Bob Church working with, with the fire hydrant painting and so forth, the things we do is just basically keep records of that. You know, John Smith did seven hours of work doing this. So it's up to us to let that chairperson know we did something in the name of Rotary, but just keep a running log of what the club is doing. And then we can submit for awards with the district for the time and effort that we all put in. We may as well get some reward for the work we do. We do a lot of it. Um, calls to your buddies. Make sure you're calling your buddy and uh, any others that are your friends that you may be able to talk into visiting with our club. Invite friends and neighbors. And I think that pretty much hits all the points that I wanted to on the agenda. Does anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Chuck, I yeah. will, since I have the screen and the projector and I'm, and Diane dumped all this other stuff on me, <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to, I'm volunteering to be the long sought after technology executive. All right. All right. You are now sworn in. <laughs> Stanley? <laughs> Stanley was a big lotting. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill. I really appreciate it. And yes, that was one thing we've been looking for. Um, all right. Well, what I want to do now is introduce a gentleman that, that we've been working with and struggling through the COVID pandemic, but Mike Ash. Mike point of order. Point of order. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Bill. Hold on. Okay, hold well, on. I'm here and uh, ready to go. If you can uh, put my presentation up and running, I will. Uh, well, we're not ready to go. I have happy dollars. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we have to do that because Burtis is here. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll get the hang of this. Um, all right. Happy dollars. Anybody happy for at least one dollar, maybe more? Um, we had a lot going on this week and uh, should be a lot of happy people. Chuck, I'll, I'll start since I've been I've been called out, if I may. All right, John. Uh, I missed a couple of meetings. I had two great fishing trips that included tuna and a 55-pound cobia, so that was a good thing. Ooh. Yeah, I know. And tilefish. And I didn't know tilefish were 50% higher in price than tuna, so I have some of the freezer I might be willing to part with for $25 a pound. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the uh, last two weeks I had family in. Last week we were in New Haven and New York City. One of the things we'll see, the Yankees got rained out, but I've got $25 for all that, including the most important thing. I was on the campus of Yale and Columbia, my first visits to uh, Ivy League schools, and I didn't get kicked out of either one. So I'm really happy about that. <laughs> so, well, they who you two, are. two of Sela's nephews, and they were great traveling buddies with the Yale and Columbia and all the New York City stuff, and just got back late Saturday night. So glad wow. to be back, 25 bucks. Were you driving or flying? I, I did. No, I drove. I drove to oh. New Haven and back. Yeah. Mm. And okay. A few days in New York City. So, and I didn't. Oh, I will tell you one thing you'll get a kick out. For those of you that know Malcolm Hayward, Malcolm is a client of mine. He's now in Florida. Like many people, he was worried about me getting shot or everybody getting shot in New York. <laughs> I told him that's a little overrated. And But he said, stop in New Jersey. He had a friend there that sell me bulletproof vests and we could set up a stand selling them in New York City. I didn't do that. <laughs> but it's still an open option for somebody that wants to try that as a uh, summer job. So I'm waiting for you to tell me you were held up and somebody stole those bulletproof vests. Uh, I, we, absolutely. No, everything was great. I mean, I would go back tomorrow. Not a problem. <laughs> okay. Bill Stram. So uh, <clears throat> I have uh, three things. Uh, so that's five dollars a piece. Whoa! Uh, my daughter and two Simpson are wrapping up their visit here. They've been here uh, since Thursday, uh, and they're in from Germany. <clears throat> so uh, haven't seen them since they left uh, in September. So it's great to have them here. The boys are uh, loving the golf cart. They were in the parade and. Uh, going to the beach and brown dog and pool and riding a golf cart and riding a golf cart and riding a golf cart. So, <laughs> but they leave tonight. So anyway, um, $15 for those three people being here. All right. Bill, you sound like you got a little bit of a cold. No, it's just, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Al, did I see your hand up? Yeah, I have five. Uh, my youngest son came down from Philadelphia for the weekend to hang out with us, so it was really good to see him. So I'm happy for that. Five. Great. Randy? Like I said earlier, uh, my wife is pledging $8 to make the total up to $14,000. So I'm, I'm good for eight bucks. Thank you, Randy. Reggie? Yes, I had 10 bucks. Uh, my uh, granddaughter, her husband, and their two sons, our great grandsons, were here. Uh, they came down on Friday evening and left yesterday. Uh, and that was a tremendous time for us. We hadn't been able to get together and hang out uh, like that for at least a couple of years, actually. And uh, we were down at the beach and we saw some of you guys down there. We saw Bill and Randy and Stan and some others. Uh, we went hanging out, so that was that was a tremendous, uh, tremendous opportunity for us to spend some time, some quality time together. Ten dollars for our, for us uh, in the uh, sure is nice being able to visit with family now, isn't it? Without having to wear the mask or worrying about things like that. Um, any other happy dollars? Okay. Well, I wanted to. I, I've uh, got. I've got some happy dollars. Okay, go ahead, Bill. Um, I have uh, $10, five because uh, I'm just so happy that we have such strong leadership uh, in our club uh, as represented by Randy, who did, as you said, an extraordinary job with the um, uh, 
golf cart raffle. I, I kind of thought we could do 10,000 easily, but Randy made the difference and really milked that thing up, uh, <laughs> up the chart. So Randy, congratulations. I'm really happy to the tune of five bucks. I'm All also right. happy uh, that I met Reggie's family. Reggie came all the way to my driveway and uh, let me bore his uh, grandchildren and, and uh, great grandchildren. And they are just delightful, Randy. So thank you so much for uh, thinking enough of me to come by to say hello. That's worth five bucks. All right. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, Again, I wanted to introduce Mike Ash, and he is heading up the restoration of the railroad cars, not just the caboose, but all of them. And, and the Rotary Club has taken on restoring um, the caboose over there. By the way, I've actually gotten a couple more commitments from uh, people to help out with caboose, um, Jim Rich. Uh, when I saw him on 4th of July, said he would like to help out. And Walter Childs are stepping up to the plate um, to help out as well. So Larry is coming along. He uh, will actually be heading back up uh, to the lumber company when the paint comes in. And we're going to get started once the paint is in, um, probably sometime next week. And uh, we can use all the help that, that we can get. I want to introduce Mike Ash. Mike, we want to hear a little bit about you and then about your overall project. Well, a um, little bit about me. I don't know. I've been retired for about 16 or 17 years. Um, retired to the Eastern Shore from Virginia Beach. Um, I spent most of my working life working on Navy weapon systems. And uh, which was quite rewarding, but retirement's the best job that I ever had. So um, I'm really enjoying it. Um, I did come along to one of your meetings uh, many years ago. Um, Art Tross introduced me, and uh, but I just felt I had too many outlets for my time to, to join up and uh, become a member at that time. And now, of course, I no longer meet the requirement of being a younger member anyway. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So anyway, um, but other than that, um, uh, yes, I am on the board of the uh, uh, Cape Charles Museum, Cape Charles Historical Society, and I'm also president of the Northampton Historic Preservation Society, and I'm in my fourth year of a two-year term of presidency there, so I'm hoping they'll let me out at the end of this year and they find somebody else to be president. So I'd like to cut back on some of these things anyway, but we have an ongoing uh, commitment to restore the jail in, in uh, Eastville, the little 1907 jail, and I'm sure I'll be involved in that for some time to come. So that's basically about me. Okay. And now about uh, your project. Well, my project I'm presenting is the Northampton Historic Preservation Society. I'm going okay. to talk to you all about them and uh, not the caboose. I think you've, you've heard about the caboose before um, when uh, Kim Denny came out and gave you a presentation, and that's when you all signed up so many years ago before the recent uh, pandemic unpleasantness. So, uh, so anyway, I'm here to talk about Northampton Historic Preservation Society. Okay, um, so you can go if, ahead. If you set me up with a split screen or whatever it is, and I can- Well, you, you can share now. If you would um, you go hover on the bottom of, of your screen in the, at the uh, green, you see the green- um, Yeah, share screen. Yeah, click on that. And then you'll see a series of frames. And one of those frames will be your presentation you click on that and then share, Mike. You're coming up. You're you're doing you great. It? All right. Outstanding. The okay. best screen we've well, ever had. <laughs> that's who we are. And uh, that's our mission statement there. Um uh oh wait a minute. 
Okay, there we go. Our origins, so we actually go back to 1913, we're, we're over 100 years old, and we were formed as a branch of the APFPVA, and uh, then later um, they became the Preservation Virginia, and they decided to get rid of all their local branches, so we formed our own organization to continue the work was, was being done. Um, the start back in 1913, I don't suppose any of you remember that, but at the back of that picture, you can see the 1899 courthouse, which is the, at the front now of the uh, administration building and where the Board of Supervisors meet. But in front of that at that time was the old 1731 courthouse, which was turned into a general store. And the Board of Supervisors wanted to tear that down because they wanted to put, or they've been talked into putting up the Confederate monument. So then a group of people got together, formed a branch of the APVA and said, we want to save the 1731 courthouse, which they did. And this is, this is how the courthouse screen was going to look with a Confederate monument there right in front of the 1899 courthouse. So anyway, in moving the courthouse, that's the 1731 courthouse on the right there. And of course, back in those days, we didn't have ace house movers or anybody like that. I don't know how they moved it but they lost part of it in the process. And on the left is a model that we have of what the original courthouse looked like. Um, as you can see, the door used to be on the side. Um, it's sort of shortened and the door is on the end. And some of that may have been done when it was converted into a store. But anyway, that's how we got started um, to save the courthouse and really preserve the Eastfield Court Green for the future. Um, so who are we now? We're an active nonprofit. We have a management of 13 directors and officers, over 100 me member families. Um, we have uh, do donation dues for membership. We have a website, we have a Facebook page, and we have email contact. So if any of you want to join us, that's the information you need. And what we do right now, we still retain overall oversight of the core green, even though that is owned by the county. All of those buildings are owned by the county. Um, we interpret them from a uh, uh, historic perspective and uh, steer visitors around. And I'll be addressing all of these items here in the next slides. So on the court green, we install this side right at the big, this sign right at the front. Um, this it, it orients visitors to all the various buildings. And if you remember the last picture, the ne right next to the 1899 courthouse on the left there, there was the uh, 1914 jail building, which was demolished uh, a couple of years ago. And we tried to fight that, but um, it really was a lost cause. It really wasn't suitable for repurposing. And uh, I think it tidied up the whole court green pretty well in not having it there. Um, so anyway, we maintain as well as we can the interior of the 1731 courthouse. We provided these benches a little context. Um, in the picture on the left, you can see one of our interpretive boards on the side that talks about us and the history of the court green and the history of Eastville and the area. And then also the clerk's office, we have uh, interpretive information in there. And uh, we maintain, uh, it just keep the place tidy, dust it out every now and again and keep it tidy. Also, center, chief, and then the debtor's prison around the back. If you've walked around the back there, there's the debtor's prison there. And we have a few interpretive signs on the wall there as well. So anyway, and then also in the 1899 courthouse, we have a little museum right inside the door with a few exhibits on the history of... Uh, of the local area and the courthouse green in particular. And it's very popular with visitors. We've got a little visitor book right inside the door and we get a lot of nice comments and it's surprising how many people pass through there. Um, same in the 1731 courthouse, we've got a visitor book there and people come from all over. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This, this particular uh, museum here is only open in business hours when the, when the administration building is open. So that's um, basically what we do for the Court of Green. Um, the other thing, we do own Pear Valley in Machapongo, which is a 1740 yeoman farmer's house as opposed to a plantation owner's house. 
So as you can see, it's a little smaller structure than most of the plantation houses around here. And it's in pretty poor shape, but we are leaving it that way because there's a lot of history there. Um, archaeologists and uh, architectural students come out and look at it and study the beams and the chamfering on the beams and things like that. And a lot of it, architectural features from 1740 that people like to look at. So all this we're really doing is, is maintaining it as a time capsule of, as it was when we took it over. Um, we do have a video on our website if you want more information, and it's really a walking tour of the whole building, history, and all the, the prominent features. And another thing we do is we have lectures on the lawn. Um, we didn't have any last year in 2020. Um, the last one we had before that was in 2019, was at Prospect Hill, out on, Bayside, on Seaside Road. And as you can see, we've got a lot of people out there. And David Scott, one of our board members, he talks about the uh, history of the building, the people who live there, the genealogy of the families that live there and how they're related as everybody's related, interrelated on the Eastern shore. And um, it's a very popular series. We asked for a $10 donation and it's a pretty good fundraiser for us. On the right there, you see some of the others. We did Chatham and the Air Rectory in 2019, and three other places in 2018, two in 17, and two in 16. Very popular series, and people enjoy them. And they're advertised on the Joe Natale's uh, email, and if you see them there, come out and join us. Um, you might find it very interesting. Okay, things I don't have on uh, slides of. Um, we conduct periodic walking tours of Eastville. Um, we recently had an event on the Court Green where we opened up the 1907 jail that we're going to restore. And we had a number of people come out there. And after that, uh, David Scott did a little walking tour of uh, Courthouse Road and a little bit of Willow Oak Road pointing out the uh, historic houses there and who lived there and some of the history. And then another thing David does because he's really into this um, conducts periodic genealogy seminars. He's got a series of four seminars. Um, we, we were going to start them last year, but they had to be postponed, and we're about to start them up again this year. So I think we're coming up on the 23rd of July. We'll be doing the first of those again. And so now our, our big project, the 1907 jail, there in the middle there, you can see the 1914 jail sandwiched between the clerk's office and the 1899 courthouse. That was demolished at the end of 2018. Um, we tried to save some of the artifacts that were in there and we did save actually that, uh, the frontage of that jail cell there because um, the jail cells there were one of the first in the country to have the locking doors where the jailer could just pull one lever and all the cell doors were closed at one time. <clears throat> and, and of course, opening in, opening in the same way. So we've tried to preserve one of the, well, we've saved one of those mechanisms. It's been sitting out in the weeds at somebody at the Garrison Brown's farm. I hope we can resurrect it to use as an exhibit. But this is the building we're going to save, the 1907 jail which is out behind there and it's very visible now, rather a sad looking building. Um, it was prepared for demolition, um, like with the 1914 jail. And we said, uh, you know, hang on, you know, we might be able to do something with that. So they'd already torn out the windows, taken all the bars off the windows and thrown everything on the floor inside the jail. So we cleared it out. Um, and uh, so we found some of the original doors, the original window bars were laying around in there. The cell, the, some of the cell doors were there. Um, so we managed to save all that and get it cleaned out. Uh, one of the features of that jail was at some time, probably shortly after it, the 1914 jail it was used and this one was no longer used, the sheriff cut a hole in the wall to, to turn the thing into a garage for his, for his car. And in doing so, he considerably weakened the structure there. So as you can see, we've had to prop up the main support beam running across, and you can see where it's sagging over that, uh, that opening there. So uh, 
We are now in the process of raising money to uh, restore this building. Uh, we received a challenge grant from the Cabell Foundation for $50,000, and we're 35, well, actually, we're cl closing in on $45,000 towards meeting that challenge. And we will then, when we've met the challenge with the Cabell donation, we will have $50,000 to restore the building. Um, it's probably, well, it's obviously that the estimates we have is at least 150,000 for the restoration. And uh, we've been talking with a company, an organization, oh, that's not there yet, an organization called Historicor, who restore a number of old buildings in the country. Um, they use donated labor, people from the local area or even nationwide who want to learn about historic restoration. They come out, camp locally or live in local homes and they provide the labor. So with $100,000 from uh, the grants and the, and the money we've raised, we'd probably get about $50,000 worth of donated labor. So that probably gives us the $150,000 we need to restore the structure. We will need additional funds and we'll continue fundraising for putting in the HVAC system, uh, running electrical wiring and things like that. Um, but if you can see those doors at the back there, when they uh, prepared it for demolition, they just cut the hinges out of the doors and threw the doors on the, on the floor. Um, we have Buck Doughty, who you may know as a, a metal artist um, and, and a real metal craftsman. He has those doors right now and he's going to restore the door jam, uh, cut the hinges off the door jam and re, re weld them back into the doors and he's going to re-erect those cell doors in there for us. And we hope to do that fairly shortly. So that's where we are with the jail. If you've got a few spare dollars, you can visit our website and uh, make a donation for the jail. And we'd be, all donations will be gratefully received. And uh, lastly, we just recently got involved in the Arlington uh, Mansion site and Custis tomb there off uh, Arlington Road. Um, the uh, Arlington uh, Foundation had that for a number of years, but they all, like the rest of us, were getting older and most of the movers and shakers have passed on. And uh, they were looking for somebody else to take over the site. Uh, the Custis tombs were originally owned by APVA and they did de uh, deed them to the Arlington Foundation. Anyway, Arlington Foundation has now sold, sold the whole site to the Nature Conservancy, I'm mean, sorry, Archaeological Conservancy, which is a nationwide organization. And uh, they go around the country preserving archaeological sites. They basically cover them over, but prevent them from being redeveloped. So they now own that. They're going to redo all the signs. They're going to keep the grass cut. They're going to restore the site. And we're going to help them locally to do that. And we do have a plan on having one of our lectures on the lawn there um, later this year, probably in September, uh, where we will, you can come along and we'll talk about the site, the Custis tombs and the, and the future of it. But uh, we won't be doing any fundraising for that because Archaeological Conservancy will provide, be providing all the funds for the maintenance of that site. And uh, we have some of the artifacts that were turned over from the Arlington Foundation that um, had at one time been on exhibit in the Cape Charles Museum. Uh, we are now going to put those into the 1819 courthouse and into the museum there and some of the interpretive signs that were in the Cape Charles Museum. And we're really going to promote that site because it is a, it's a cultural gem on the Eastern shore. It really is. And there's a lot of history to be told. And I think uh, it really needs to be told. So I think we're hoping the Archaeological Conservancy will be very good stewards of it. And we can present that as a, an archaeological site and a, a historic site on the Eastern Shore, much better than it has been in the past. And that, I think, is the end of my presentation. Yes, it is. So any questions? Yeah, Mike, uh, this is Bill Payne. Uh, with respect to the um, 1907 um, jail, is it going to be repurposed or just uh, will it be a museum? It's going to be primarily a museum. Um, 
It will be open to the public uh, 24-7, just like the other buildings. So it's somewhat <clears throat> limited what we can put in there. Um, we did get a grant from Virginia Humanities for $10,000. Well, we haven't actually got it yet. It's probably not for publication yet until they announce it. But um, that will be for um, uh, an exhibit in there, really, on the stories of Eastville, the people who live there, and some of the, the action, the jurisprudence, people who were jailed in Eastville, not necessarily in that jail, and some of their misdemeanors demeanors and that. And then we will also have the Arlington uh, site information there for, for the tourists to find the site and go visit it. Um. Mike, if, if you don't want to answer this, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but was the jail a white-only jail? Ah, uh, I don't think there was any uh, any discrimination there, whoever it was. There's two cells at the front which were um, designated at the time um, for women or insane, for the insane, and then the, the rear part, the open area, which you saw in my picture, that had four cells in the center there. And I think it was just anybody who was, you know, any miscreant was jailed there until they, they could appear in court. And it was really associated with the courthouse rather than the long-term jail. It was a holding, holding cells for people who had court appearances. And depending on the outcome of that, they went somewhere else or they might, if it was just a short-term incarceration, they would be held in that jail. But no, as far as I know, there was no, no discrimination whatsoever as to who was in the jail. It was the only jail in Eastville at the time. Thank you. Hey, Mike, uh, this is John Burtis. Most of the people in the club know that my wife, Celia Burtis, became a judge last year. Just as the pandemic started, she was elected by the legislature, and they have a deal for judges called an investiture, which is a, can be married with a swearing in or can be a separate ceremony. Hers has been delayed, but she was sworn in by her predecessor, Crox and Gordon, in the presence of the clerk in the old courthouse. Uh, so we made use of that and uh, it was in nice shape and it's a great place. And so it was very uh, neat to be able to use that because the main courthouse was closed down and uh, we were able to go in there and get her sworn in. So thank you for keeping it up. That, that was in the 1899 courthouse? Or yes. The, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the county did a very good job of, of maintaining that. And they've, um, I don't know who at the county does it. I think it may be J.S. Williams and um, uh, Tracy, Tracy Adams. Uh, anyway, yeah. Tracy and, um, they, they, they do, I mean, there's all those historic photographs along there and there's, right. there's artifacts in the hall. They, they do a wonderful job of the history of Eastville and, and Northampton County. It's, it's, a, it's a well worth a visit. Yeah. Mike, um, I do a lot of historical research. I am a genealogist too, but um, as far as Eastville as a court, not necessarily the courthouses themselves, my understanding is Eastville is the oldest continuous court in colonial America. It was the first and it's the oldest continuous even to today. Is that true? It's the oldest continuous court records. We, right. we still have the records going back uh, into the 17th century. Um, and the reason for that is that um, they were always stored in, in a fireproof building. Um, and so they were never destroyed by fire. And of course, during the, the Civil War, the uh, Eastern Shore was occupied almost immediately by the Union Army. Um, other courthouses in Virginia were required to send their, their records to Richmond for safekeeping. And of course, most of them got destroyed in Richmond. Yeah. So yeah. that's the reason we have the oldest ones here. They've, they've never been destroyed. They've never been disturbed all these years. They've just been added to. So, And, that, and that's a real source of, of genealogical information. Yes, and that's one of the things David Scott's going to do with his lectures is, is uh, tell people, you know, give some demonstrations of how you research those records. What's in there if you want to look up the history of your family, um, land transfers and things like that. How you go about that in those records. And wills. And wills, yeah, wills are recorded there, yes. And of course, uh, all of the uh, 
I think the uh, County Board of Supervisors records are there, and there's a lot of old newspaper records there too. So it's a, it's a trove of information if you know how to navigate it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing about the Custis Plantation, um, that really is a deep part of our history. Um, I, I don't know. I think most people understand Martha Washington, George Washington's wife, that was his, her second marriage. Her first marriage was to Augustus. Um, so I believe that is linked over to the, the Custis family that lived on the Eastern shore. And uh, they actually ended up coming over early from the Jamestown settlement uh, to the Eastern shore. Um, am I right on all that? Yes, you are. And, and that mansion was built there. There, are, there were no contemporary pictures of it. We've no idea what it looks like, looked like. From the foundations, um, Colonial Williamsburg researched the foundations quite a lot, some year, I think 1994, and they came up with a, a model of what they thought the building was like, and it's very similar to things like Rosewell over in the uh, Newport News area, or Yorktown area, and things like that. But you know, these the Custis family had other houses to live in. Of course, the um, one at Arlington now, which is now Arlington National Cemetery, that was their property, and they just quit living on the Eastern Shore and let the place fall down. But it was a it was a three story significant mansion at the time. Yeah. One other real quick question: the Pear Valley Farm uh, is that the one that's sitting on the Barrier Island Center property? No, 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 no. It's um. Um, just before you get there, you turn left on uh, Wilsonia Neck, go about half a mile and you'll see a, a, a brown sign private road called Fair Valley and it's, it's, it's back in there. Okay, thank you. Anybody hey, else have questions for Mike or comments? Look, I wanted to mention too that about these records and maybe you know this, maybe Mike knows this probably does. A former tenant of mine when we had renters in the building years ago, was a retired professor and he took it upon himself to transcribe the original records and put them in published books and he got about six or seven volumes done i don't recall if he got into the 1700s or not he since passed away but those books are available at the clerk's office and yes they're, yeah. they're a tra transcription of the actual records which helps a lot because they're they're in old english and they're hard to read a lot of them are. So yeah, yeah they're all they're all handwritten and uh, yes yeah, they, they sure are. I've looked at some of the old records, um, not just there, but many other courthouses. And when they are in the old English, besides the terrible handwriting, <laughs> the old English language and the way they phrase things can be a little confusing and a little hard to read. Mike, um, you might want to tell us where you're originally from. <laughs> well, I'm originally from England. Um... I came over here in 1967. I had a job offer with Bell Aerospace in Buffalo, New York, and I lived there for five years and uh, decided there might be somewhere better to live than Buffalo, New York. And uh, uh, I joined a company in Buffalo who had a, a contract down in Virginia Beach with the Navy at Damneck, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> Well, you, you need to work on that Virginia accent just a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, we really appreciate your time today. I really appreciate it because like I say, I'm, I'm really, for over 60 years, I've been very much interested in history, primarily the US, but also world history. So I found your, your talk today very interesting and uh, I've made some visits up to Eastville and. I, I'm not going to stop visiting there and uh, looking at old court records. So it's it's a fun hobby of mine. Um, anybody else have any more questions or comments for Mike? Okay. If not, does anybody have anything else uh, to bring up for the good of the for the good of the club? All right, Bill, if you would. For things we think, do, and say is the Rotary Club. Number one. Is it the is truth? It the truth. <laughs> Two. Is it is fair? fair to all concerned. Three. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And four. Will, will it be, be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned?
Everybody have a great week. Try to stay cool. Stanley, and, speak uh, up. Hey, we're gonna have we're gonna have some fun too. That's right. And don't forget that sunscreen if you're out and about town. It is hot up. Dr. Clark and, and Paul Strong are gonna be watching for you. Make sure you're putting that sunscreen on. Hey, Diane, okay. will you stay back uh, along with Chuck? Yes. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bill, you can release the share screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, next, week after next, the 20, 20th of July, I have court duty. I'm on this, I'm on this special grand jury. So I will not be able to drive on the 20th. Diane, could you come out of retirement for one meeting? <laughs> yes, I can do that. This now, now here's the deal. And I've been thinking about this really hard. What I can do is start the um, a Zoom meeting before I go leave for, for court, which is like 8.30 in the morning. And if you would join on in, uh, Diane, I can make you host. And then you can go back to bed or whatever if you're not up. Can you do that? So on July the 20th, you want to start the meeting at 8.30. And then it's going to stay open until our our meeting time of, of 12 noon. Yeah, through, through 1 o'clock. Okay. Uh, and that way uh, we don't have to do all this craziness we did last time with- Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does that mean I have to stay on? No, you don't, no, you don't. So I can, I can disconnect. No, no, you don't disconnect. What you do is just- uh, Oh, I can't do that then because I have client meetings and I use Zoom for it. You, you, you use your own Zoom though. It's the same. Oh. Oh, God. So is there any way that one of us can start the meeting? Only if I, if you have a license and it's too late for that. Um, and uh, I give you permission to, it, there, there's a designation, I think it's called, it's not, it's not co-host, it's alternate host or something. We did that with um, Murphy, oh, Murphy when I had... Um, um, well, does he st is he still set up? What's that? Is he still set up for that? No, no, because I discontinued his license. Oh. See, it was a full license just to do that. I Another see. 16 bucks. Wow. Um, and I wonder if I could get... Uh, the so the issue is that Jackie knows how to do it, but she's in Los Angeles, and it would mean getting her up at like five in the morning. So, uh, well, wait a minute. If you 